Thank you, Mike. As always, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Now, let's continue with today's keynote. As Mike mentioned, we have uh, Hebe Schenker and Eisen Air Cargo with us today. So we're proud to share this special treat of uh, true outside of the box thinking and problem solving with you uh, today. We will hear from Asso Kumar, who's the EVP of Air Freight uh, for DB Schenker Americas, and Gunnar Segofinson, Managing Director at Eisen Air Cargo. And we're gonna hear the story of how two unlikely strategic partners uh, came together in a time of crisis to keep one of New York City's most crucial supply chains up and running when it was needed most. Uh, Asok, Guna, the stage is yours. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you, Michael. Um, I trust uh, everyone can hear me and can see the presentation as well. Yes, we can hear and see you. All right. Thank you again. So I uh, really appreciate uh, to be uh, to be speaking to all of you today um, on this uh, uh, virtual uh, plug and play uh, session about innovation. Um, I want to walk you through uh, the agenda that I'll be sharing with you today in the next 10 to 15 minutes. And, and uh, whilst first talking a little bit about uh, DB Schenker, the company I work for, um, the emphasis that I would like to place here is really about uh, innovation and how we've kept that at the forefront of what we do and how it's built into our DNA, uh, not only through the current crisis that we are uh, currently all going through, but also in terms of past crisis as well that we had to uh, obviously navigate through. Uh, and then once I finish with that, just two or three slides, uh, bear with me. And I'd really like to focus the bulk of my time on what exactly we had to do in the current situation with COVID-19 and how our cooperation with Iceland there actually brought forward solutions uh, that allowed us to continue to sustain operations and perhaps more importantly, support our customers and the industry as a whole in these very trying times. With that, let me just quickly, using numbers now, uh, to give you a picture of the kind of business DB Shanker does. Uh, and I tried to relate this more into things that you can relate to day-to-day -day things, for example. So when I look at land transport, 107 million shipments, I mean, what does that actually translate to? It's like we move three shipments uh, every second. And just to tell you the volume that's involved there, in terms of air freight, those 1.2 million tons translates to 222,000 elephants. That's what we typically move in a year. Uh, ocean freight, if you stack up the containers that we move in a year, it would stretch from Dubai to Hawaii. Uh, and, the, and the last uh, item here, and I just have to move this away so I can see it, contract logistics, just uh, the amount of space that, that we actually occupy and use for our customers, the size of 1,230 soccer fields. So these are the four primary business units of our company, and you can see how much of volume that we actually move to the supply chain every year. And, and that has then allowed us into these industry leading positions globally, be it number three in ocean, ocean freight, number one in land, uh, number three in, in global air, as well as being number five in contract logistics. But this kind of market leading positions would not be possible if we did not have innovation in our DNA. This is a key component of how we've been successful in the past and how we continue to keep ourselves in the forefront of technology. So this is just very quickly sharing with you at some technological, this is very quickly sharing with you some technologies that we've been working on in the past and we continue to work on moving ahead, be it pontooning of trucks which helps with fuel efficiency. Um, Michael talked about drones earlier. We're very much into that technology as well that we can actually deliver bulk shipments, not just parcels using drones, driverless trucks. Uh, these glass that the gentleman is wearing there allows our people in the warehouse to, without having any equipment, to know what to pick and so on and so forth. And then. About 10 years ago, we started a train from China, slightly more than 10 years ago, a train from China into Europe, which was again, uh, uh, industry leading at that time. And all these innovations that many of them obviously coming forward in a time of, you know, when things are going well, you know, also served us that DNA culture that I talked about here also served us to times of crisis in the past, uh, be it the financial crisis in 2008, be it the volcanic eruption, which Guna, you're also very familiar with, that was in the Iceland, uh, which then created this ash cloud around the world, disrupted flight operations globally, obviously cargo impacted as well. And at each one of these points in time in the past, each one of these crisis moments, we had to continue to think out of the box, not only to keep our 
supply chain intact, but to continue to support our customers and ensure that nothing breaks apart. But what I would really like to focus now on is this uh, nasty virus, the picture of which you see here, which is arguably the, the most uh, 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 disruptive uh, uh, pandemic or the most disruptive event that to happen to us in, in, in the near, in near times. And then what I would then like to talk about is what exactly do we do when faced with this particular situation to stay and continue to sustain our supply chain and to stay uh, uh, with our customers and continue to support uh, what they need to do in this current situation. And, and now I'd like to spend the bulk of my um, time on this, on this. And in order for everyone to understand exactly why we needed to come up with these uh, out of the box thinking and, and, and uh, solutions, I'd just like to take you back two to three months at the situation that we had in March and April of this year. And that pretty much came with governments around the world making announcements, restricting travel for individuals, obviously to prevent uh, the spread of the pandemic at the time. So there was, flight, uh, there was restrictions for uh, people residing in, the, in, in Europe to come to the US and now it's vice versa and so on and so forth. And that was just happening around the world. And inevitably that, what that created was a, a huge major drop in passenger demand, which then obviously meant uh, capacity, the planes were grounded and capacity came out of the market. And we are talking about 80% of the belly hole capacity of planes coming out of the market at that point in time, 80%. So you can imagine for, for companies like ours, which continues to keep the supply chain effective, uh, moving goods for our customers, how much of an impact that has on us to be able to continue to operate and support our customers' needs when up to 80% of the belly hole capacity just comes off the market in an extremely short time frame. And to further uh, complicate it, I would say, or to further make it even more difficult for everyone, then there was a sudden demand for PPE, personal protective equipment, uh, be it masks, be it uh, gloves, be it uh, uh, goggles, uh, uh, medical gowns, and so on and so forth, to help fight the pandemic. And as it turned out, 70 to 80% of these um, uh, PPE was being manufactured in China. So that resulted in a major stranglehold on uh, the airports in China, um, massive backlogs of cargo um, that then obviously led to increased rates because capacity was short in the market. As I mentioned, 70 to 80% of the belly hole capacity was out of the market. So that then resulted in inflated rates. And literally, I mean, we were at a situation where it was just extremely difficult, if not impossible at times to move freight. And then obviously with the passenger planes coming off the market because passenger travel is not happening, so the belly hole coming out of the market, you know, everyone gravitated towards using freighter capacity to support their supply chain needs. But that simply meant every single available freighter that we could find in the market that was available was flying. And it was just impossible in short notice to get any new freighter capacity as the demand picked up. So at a point, at the point in April or May, when we, if you, for example, asked a freighter operator uh, if you could have an aircraft to operate, they would typically say you need to wait a month before you can get the capacity on. So plain and simple, the situation we faced at that time required us to think of a solution that not only addressed the capacity needs of the market at that time, but it was also financially viable because freighter capacity and freight rates were extremely high in this very volatile situation. So we really had to think out of the box and think of how we could um, mitigate this situation in the circumstances that we faced. And that's when we just thought to ourselves, we said, well, freighters are being fully utilized. There's literally just no aircraft available out there. Passenger planes are not flying because the passenger demand is not there. However, if we had sufficient cargo demand for these passenger planes, could we not fly them as a freighter? Now that sounds logical enough to everyone because you see all these passenger planes parked in airports and not doing anything, just use them to fly freight. Not so easy, not so easy. As a start, a passenger plane carries at most 25 to 30% of the capacity of what a freighter can carry. So when you talk about economic viability and financial viability, if you can only load 30% of freight on a freighter, that freighter is obviously not economically or financially viable to operate. So we really had to work with our partner carriers and think about how do we make this viable to use these planes sitting on the ground and fly, put them in the air to carry cargo and how we could make that efficient. And we approached a number of carriers, talk about that and to start discussing solutions. And we needed this really quick because the demand in the market was so high. And Iceland Air came out and said, 
you know, m many of the terrorists we spoke to balked at it and said, you know, some said, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take my beautiful passenger plane and use it for cargo. Some said, well, it just doesn't make sense financially. It won't work. But Iceland there was one partner carrier that said, hmm, interesting. Let's look at that. And they were very positive in terms of supporting us with this idea. Long story short, and I will not go into these details now. There's a lot of numbers that all of you can see simply because Gunnar, Managing Director of Iceland Air Cargo, is going to now present his piece, and he will go into a lot more detail on this. But long story short, we operated three planes, passenger 767 planes, which Gunnar will soon explain to you how he made that into cargo planes. Um, the capacity that we were able to load on the planes is there, you can see as well, and there's a lot of information about crewing and how we managed that. And when you look at, at the end, the flights that we operated with that solution with Iceland Air in May, uh, daily flights into Europe, and then obviously we had flights also to support the city of New York, 11 flights that we operated in June uh, um, to make that operation viable and possible. So with that, I'd really like now to switch into, uh, to hand it to Gunnar to explain to, to all of you um, the challenges he had to actually make the solution effective. Because for us as Schenker, to reach out to Gunnar and say, it's logical, let's do this, let's work on this solution, uh, uh, straightforward. But for Gunnar and Iceland there then, the amount of things he had to do behind the scenes, technically, as well as with, with uh, airport authorities and others to get this off the ground in a very short span of time, I repeat, uh, in a very short span of time, uh, uh, was extensive. So with that, Gunnar, I'd like to hand it to you, please. And if you can get into your piece. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me see. I'm trying to get this under control here. I can't get the show. Mm. Let me see. I'm trying to share the screen. Uh, uh, I don't know why this is not working at my end now. The screen is already shared. You just need to start presenting. Yeah, I push the. Let me share another screen. Perfect. Is this working? Yes. It should be working. Okay. Okay. Um, is it? Is it not moving? I. Oh. What is wrong now? Sorry about this. Let me see. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, I now see. it's working. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry about this. Uh, my uh, name is Gunnar Maurer. I'm uh, Managing Director of Iceland the Cargo. Just want to go through the uh, work we did with DP Schenker. Iceland the Group is an 83 year old organization. Uh, we are privately owned. Uh, we have a home market of 330,000 uh, people. And we are located uh, uh, in the middle of nowhere, as some people say. So our location has pushed us to uh, be an innovative company to drive business through our, comp uh, through our country uh, and connect with the rest of the world. We have been operating mostly with profit since we started. Uh, uh, with innovation, we have built up an airline uh, that competes with uh, major legacy carriers in big markets. Uh, we fly from Europe to North America, and we have 40 destinations uh, around uh, in, in Europe and uh, North America and 20 actually before COVID in North America and only British Airways has the same number of destinations in, in North America as we do from uh, operating out of Europe. We actually were the first low-cost airline in the world which might surprise some of you but uh, uh, we established a low-cost carrier uh, in, year, in the 60s uh, flying between uh, US and Europe. Uh, we are the biggest company in Iceland uh, but uh, we can say that we are a small in the aviation world. But some people say that uh, even though we are small, we have the biggest yacht of all. So I don't know if that's true. But we have been uh, leading the tourism in Iceland uh, from the beginning. And in the last uh, 25 years, we have 25-fold uh, uh, the numbers of, of uh, tourists visiting Iceland. Uh, and now last year, 
uh, we had two point uh, before COVID, we had 2.5 million, uh, which is a lot in a country of 330,000 inhabitants. Iceland Air is just like any other uh, airline. Uh, we fly passengers and cargo. However, uh, we are also known for being innovative uh, and more innovative than, than most uh, airlines. Uh, we uh, operate in, in uh, needs markets uh, like uh, Papua New Guinea and uh, Venezuela. We operate luxury tours uh, and uh, around the world flights for uh, tour operators, luxury tour operators. We operate uh, frequently to undeveloped locations uh, on behalf of the United Nations. And we also operate the first commercial aircraft uh, to Antarctica, uh, with, as you can see on the picture here. Uh, we are used to deal with crisis, all kinds of crisis, uh, volcano eruptions, uh, and also financial crisis, and, uh, and now uh, the virus. And we know, and we have learned, uh, that uh, the answer is not only to cut cost, but uh, the best answer to a crisis is to innovate. Uh, as everybody else uh, in the aviation world, uh, our network shrink, uh, shrunk down to 3 to 4 percent of its normal size in, in, in few days after the uh, COVID uh, virus uh, became uh, common in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, in a short while, North America closed uh, and Europe uh, had a lot of restrictions. And on top of it, even though we were flying, there was uh, absolutely no demand for our, our business like uh, for any other airlines. Uh, basically, the, the, the desire of travel went down to, to zero. So how could we generate uh, revenues when we had the cost there and uh, but no revenues uh, to deal with? Uh, uh, or to, 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 to pay the cost. So uh, how, how could we survive uh, through a period of, of time uh, without uh, revenues? And what were the options we had to, to, uh, to act and, and change this uh, or get some revenues out of the situation? The only possible way we saw was to, uh, to focus on freight. And we realized uh, that uh, to use the passenger aircraft uh, as, as, uh, for the freight was maybe a, 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 an opportunity that could uh, bring us uh, or give us the revenues uh, we needed. Uh, DP Schenker uh, invited us uh, or asked us to fly uh, for them, or that actually DP Schenker in Iceland asked us to fly to China to pick up some uh, medical uh, equipment for the Icelandic hospitals. Actually, they were thinking about uh, asking us to use the 757 freighters we have, but we realized that it was not possible. And we saw that the only way to do this was to use uh, the 767 passenger aircraft. And as many airlines at uh, that time, uh, there was a lot of discussion uh, about loading boxes in, simply into the, into the seats and the belly holds. And so we did, uh, and we went three trips to, uh, to uh, China uh, on behalf of the Icelandic hospitals. And everything worked uh, perfectly, uh, perfect as, as planned, and uh, even our, uh, our crew or the pilots became famous because they uh, innovated a, a bit on the way. Uh, they, they made a heart around the Icelandic hospital on the way uh, back to Iceland from China, um, uh, basically uh, to honor the, the, the frontline staff uh, at the hospitals dealing with, uh, uh, with uh, the, the virus. And this became very famous and went all over the world. But we realized this was not, uh, it was doable, but it was, uh, but was it practical? Basically, that was the question we, uh, we asked ourselves, was it sustainable operation? We felt it was uh, very complicated to load uh, the aircraft. It took up to 15 hours on the ground uh, to, to load it and potential, uh, and we saw also that uh, there was a high chance of, uh, of damaging the expensive interior. And also on top of it, the seats were limiting the payload. So we felt it was very impractical to, to, uh, to, to continue working like this. So we uh, start to think how we could be an option for airlines uh, flying more flights like this. Uh, and uh, and uh, we realized that if we, would, uh, if we should be an option, we did have to come up with a solution in a very short time that would be appealing for, uh, for uh, partners like DP Schenker to, to work with. And uh, we start to uh, think and plan and, uh, and uh, soon we decided uh, that the best way would be to take out the seats. But to take out the seats 
and start to load boxes uh, into the cabin is not, not as easy as it uh, as it uh, sounds because you cannot just uh, throw the boxes in and and uh, load them as in a normal uh, freighter you have to distribute uh, and uh, the, the 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 weight uh, on on the cabin floor and to make sure that the uh, uh, that the cabin will uh, survive the transport and uh, that you will not uh, put uh, the heavy weight in one place and uh, and you will uh, follow all the instructions that, that I will explain later on. And if you look at the picture here, you see the the the, the, the boxes or the white uh, white uh, areas which are marked. That is basically to help us to load correctly into the aircraft. We had ma many challenges to overcome. Uh, first of all, small airline uh, with uh, small aircraft uh, located somewhere uh, far away from the markets in need for the, uh, the service. Uh, we had on top of it, we had very limited traffic rights uh, to operate to China. But we realized that we would have to be one of the first one uh, with an attractive solution. And uh, actually we started to work on uh, all kinds of, or to, to brainstorm of how we could solve this if we would get an opportunity. Uh, but we realized the task was complicated and we had a limited time to solve uh, the issues we need to solve. So when, so we had to solve all kinds of problems that we have never dealt with before. Uh, first of all, we did have to convince our CEO, which absolutely thought or thought we were, uh, I was mad when I asked him if we were able to take out the seats and start to load boxes into the cabin. Uh, but then uh, he, uh, he was, con uh, he, uh, but when he realized that it was the only way to get revenues, he accepted it. Uh, we did have to encourage everyone in our team to believe this was uh, possible. And uh, we did have to design and structure the cabin, as I said uh, before, uh, to be uh, allowed to, uh, to carry the cargo and uh, to make sure that uh, it will, would not uh, move or, or the floor would, or the cabin floor would, uh, would stay or would, uh, would bear the, the weight uh, as, as it came in. We did have to calculate and plan the loading and that was the marks you saw on the, on the, on the picture before. Uh, we, would, we, would, we of course had to fulfill all obligations uh, towards security like fire issues and all kinds of issues that came up when you start to load cargo into the cabin. And we need to get allowances to carry, uh, carry trade in the cabin from the aviation authorities. We had to convince them that we were doing the right thing. And there was no role model uh, uh, from Boeing or anyone uh, that helped us to, to do this. We just simply have to innovate this from, from scratch. We did have to get traffic rights between Iceland, China and Germany, which was really complicated and usually take uh, about 60 days. And we had uh, around about five days to complete this. And we did have to plan 36 hour operation with limited option for crew rest, basically let the crew stay on board uh, and, uh, and sleep uh, on board the aircraft uh, during the flight. We did have to plan and set up a ground operation in China, uh, which uh, is a destination we don't uh, operate to. Um, and then on top of it, 90% of, of our staff was either on 50% salary uh, uh, with 50% work commitment or had just been laid off uh, and was working their notice. So it was not the best uh, time to motivate people to do good things. And then all other technical issues uh, that uh, operational issues, uh, technical and operational issues we had to deal with uh, during the process. Uh, we had the first meeting uh, with uh, DP Schenker on April the 16th, and nine days later we were uh, on the we had the first flight to China, and uh, this would not have been possible uh, uh, except uh, by, except with the support from uh, from uh, DP Schenker that uh, that and trust because. Every time they asked us uh, if we could do this and that, we always uh, went uh, back and, and, and said we would, uh, we would clear, and, clear it and give them answer uh, the day after, and, uh, and we did. And they always trust us to solve what, uh, what was needed to solve. And that was really crucial because it is not uh, easy to change uh, passenger aircraft to a freighter uh, operation and then back to passenger uh, operation again after the, this was over. We realized we needed to get the revenue, so that was driving us uh, when we saw that it was possible, then everybody was really motivated. But uh, we got no, uh, not possible many, many times, but we kept going and together with our specialists, we found the solution for all the issues we had to solve. Uh, 
we did have to rely on a lot of people outside the organization for many things. For example, traffic rights, which normally take 60 days, I said. We managed to get that in uh, five days with help of embassies in uh, China, in Iceland, in Germany, and even the foreign minister of Iceland uh, helped us, as well as the, as the minister of transport from Germany. Uh, approval for the changes of the aircraft, it was, uh, it was all new. Nobody has done it before. All kinds of security issues, which are really uh, string in, in, uh, which are really, you have to do the right thing when you're, uh, when you're operating an aircraft. You cannot uh, do any, any, any shortcuts. You have to do everything in a proper way. Set up an operation in China uh, and to operate uh, without a crew in China. These were, were all uh, issues we, we had to deal with and, of course, uh, to maintain the trust uh, from the Pishenka team. Did we succeed? Yes, we flew 75 trips uh, on, the, on the aircraft. Uh, to or the aircraft to uh, to China, 23 trips to North America, 52 trips to uh, Germany, and approximately 500 employees uh, were involved in the operation. And the moral, finally, the moral of the story: uh, we had to find a way, and we were pushed to to generate revenues for our company, and uh, uh, we had, to, of course, to gain a support and trust from our partner, DB Schenker because if they would not have believed in us, we would never have had the opportunity to finalize this and do what uh, was uh, needed. Um, and we had to think outside of the box. And, uh, and we have to be optimistic and positive to all the issues we were dealing with. And of course, we had to uh, create a winner and, uh, winner's mentality in our team and let the team believe that we were on the right way all the time. Uh, we had to believe in our experts and support them all the way. And we had to believe in all our solutions, uh, big and small. And we had to deliver what we promised uh, from day one. Uh, and, uh, and of course, if we had a problem, we had to solve it immediately. Now I think it's uh, the right time, Caroline, that you would take over and show them the video which uh, presents basically the, uh, uh, the operation quite, quite well. So that's, that's all from me. So I guess Asok, you are going to continue. Yes, uh, I'm gonna, I'm just uh, putting up the... Is this your present? Okay, I'm sorry. Let me just make sure that I uh, get it to the right, uh, right uh, area. So, um, 
thanks Gunnar for that. And again, I just like to emphasize, uh, and I, I know we have a, a bit of a time uh, pressure here, so let me just go through quickly. But uh, I just like to emphasize uh, again the support that we got from Iceland. There, you know, uh, many of you on on uh, here probably are from the industry, so you may understand, uh, you know, how difficult it is uh, to do this. But uh, to those of you who don't. Uh, Prior to COVID-19 happening, I, I do not recall a time when a passenger plane at a very short notice, uh, you know, seats were just taken out. It was used for moving cargo and then uh, obviously seats going back in again and used for a passenger plane uh, at a very short notice. And converting a passenger plane into a freighter, that, that happens quite often in the industry and that's a permanent uh, change. But doing it uh, this way as what Guna explained to you is uh, clearly something unusual and I really appreciate that support from Iceland there, Guna. But now I'd like to very quickly share with you how this actually worked for one of our customers, how this solution that I talked about that we both talked about was supporting a customer. And here, uh, it was the city of New York actually. And in order for uh, you, or everyone to understand the situation that the city was in back in April and, and May, um, uh, as a start in the US, uh, the cases of COVID was accelerating and, and going through the roof back in April and May, and particularly in New York. New York was the hardest hit uh, state a city at that time in the United States, and it was completely overwhelming, I can understand for the people there. And simply it came to a point where the need for PPE was so dramatically, the government was supporting and there was a lot coming in, but it was just so dramatically high because of the large number of cases which accelerated in a very short time frame that uh, they just needed to go out and look for ways to bring this uh, equipment in, uh, particularly from China. The governor there obviously under a lot of stress and pressure to get this happening. So this is where we came into the picture. And the challenge that was facing the city at that time and then how we could help them was simply the following. I mean, when they approach us and start to talk to us and say, how can you help us to position PPE to New York as quickly as possible? Um, you know, the information that we had from them was really uh, uncertain. Number one, the volume of orders was unclear. It was changing very uh, frequently. Um, uh, the, from this amount to that amount, so on and so forth. So it was difficult for us to nail it down and decide what exactly we needed to do to support. There was a lot of big decisions, obviously, from the city, whether they use ocean or, or air freight, because uh, obviously, uh, financially, it's, 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 it's uh, not so difficult to use the ocean freight, but there's a time-like situation, uh, situation there. You know, when was the cargo going to be available? When was the PP going to be available in China? Uh, which suppliers? Plus a lot of regulations that the Chinese authorities were putting on the movement of PPE all had to be taken into consideration. Uh, which was the port of loading? Was it going to be Nanjing, Shanghai, uh, um, uh, you know, many different uh, possible ports, so Chengdu, uh, that we would possibly uh, receive the PPE and load and move it to the US. And certainly, last but not least, when we asked, when do you need this? It was yesterday. It was super, super urgent, and they just needed an accelerated situation to have this come in. And if you would recall what I said to you earlier, Finding freighters and capacity in that environment was just completely uh, impossible in some cases. They want the freight yesterday. Uh, we talked to a freighter operator and they said, well, come back to me in a month and I'll have a plane available for you. So it was extremely critical. And this is where the solution with Iceland Air was absolutely perfect because with the three aircraft that Gunnar had fitted out for us to use, we could deploy them wherever we needed them to be happening. Uh, he talked about how he was able to get expedited traffic rights and so on and so forth from authorities. So it was very quick. We had an expedited transit because these were dedicated aircraft that we could use for that purpose. Um, service integrity was strong and it was all within our control, be it with Gunnar, or Iceland Air or ourselves. We were very experienced at the time with operating PPE, so we knew the regulations, the administration requirements around, so that whole piece was taken care of. It was a very flexible solution. You saw earlier these challenges that the city of New York had in terms of telling us when they needed the plane, how much how much of a freight needed to be moved, which port of loading, so on and so forth. So it had to be flexible in, in our ability to meet that. And this is where this solution with Iceland Air was very flexible. And certainly last but not least, it was financially viable because we had a long-term arrangement with Iceland Air, which allowed us to have a very commercially, financially viable solution uh, for the city at that point in time. So it all worked out extremely well. We moved, we had 11 flights uh, moved for the city, primarily to the month of June. We moved 30 million uh, medical gowns. We moved uh, uh, 10 million uh, goggles and, and gloves and, and um, masks as well. So a lot of that uh, to support the city with their fight uh, with COVID-19 at that uh, critical point in time. And that's basically it, a successful uh, solution that we deployed for a customer that had a pressing need at that point in time. And this Iceland Air solution 
was absolutely um, uh, perfect for that situation. So thank you very much. Appreciate uh, my sharing. Thank you, Aslak. Thank you, Gunnar. Um, we, we did get a couple of questions. So um, if you don't mind, I would love to uh, just quickly run through a, a short Q&A. And if our attendees have some more questions, you can always leave it in the Q&A below. And I'm sure Asok and Guna will uh, stay around for a little bit to answer them in written form. Um, sure. What uh, would you two love to see from um, some of the airports? Uh, since we have a lot of um, senior executives from airports from around the world uh, tuned in right now, what would you love to see from them uh, in terms of um, innovative solutions to make the whole process more seamless? Because as you both are probably well aware, um, Shanghai being a um, uh, choking point, so to say, for the supply chain, especially at the height of the pandemic, had a lot of um, yeah, a long, long, long lines uh, of trucks uh, trying to get into the airport. What do you think uh, would be needed to make that process more efficient? Well, I don't know. If, would you like to start, Arsok, or should I? Um, go ahead, go now. <laughs> okay. Since, well, since for the aircraft, it's uh, of course uh, the most important thing is to get it quickly in and quickly out. So everything has to be built around that, and uh, that is basically the the biggest favor we get from from the airport uh, authorities. Uh, if it is uh, a simple uh, operation, uh, we can get quickly in and quickly out, uh, and we get all the information in time we need. Then we are happy. That's basically how it is. And, and in tandem with that, on our side, um, you know, it's it's basically the facilities at the airport and the ability to move cargo in and out seamlessly. So, uh, it, understandably, airports obviously build their infrastructure to meet existing demand uh, in terms of number of gates, uh, warehouses, uh, uh, facilities, access points, so on and so forth. Obviously, always with the security component in mind. When things uh, accelerate or get to the point of what happened, for example, in Shanghai, where the congestion was completely uh, unanticipated, then obviously queues start to build up. You know, there were stories of trucks having to queue up after two days and to just get into the facility to offload their cargo into the terminals. And then terminals being congested to the point where you know, ULDs and shipments were just being put on top of each other, uh, um, which is obviously not, not ideal. Uh, then that obviously making it difficult to access aircraft and to load. So really for, for our side, it's really gonna be about infrastructure and about having seamless processes that allow us to, in a time of crisis particularly, to get cargo in quickly, obviously bearing in mind all the security requirements around that, uh, to have them process through as efficiently as possible so that you know, we can load the plane and uh, get it out. I mean, Gunnar, you would very well know a plane sitting on the ground doesn't, it's not financially viable for you. So you'd like them to go in, get loaded and fly out, right? And, and that did yeah. not all happen in this uh, situation but, but of, in Shanghai, right? But of course, security is one of the most important parts. Absolutely, well. absolutely. So always with that in mind as well. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, the plane being on the ground uh, and getting the cargo in and out quickly, um, you mentioned that at the beginning, it took uh, 15 hours to load the aircraft uh, mm -hmm. with um, the, the cargo. What else did you uh, try and do to make it more efficient besides uh, removing the seats? Did you use any technology uh, in this aspect? Yeah, we used uh, what you call it, uh, slides to, to uh, roll the boxes into the aircraft. We brought our own, uh, own loadmaster team uh, and then in the end, uh, the, or, or uh, not in the end, uh, the, the whole, through the whole process, the pilots start to load as well. So everybody was uh, was uh, putting hands uh, to make this uh, as as quick as possible. It was it is complicated to to load uh, an aircraft like this, as we, because as I said, you have to be careful regarding the, the weight on the floor and the the, the height limits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but uh, when you have uh, twelve uh, people from our our team and then uh, the the local people. Uh, uh, also, then, then it it worked uh, pretty seamless uh, or, or, or quick uh, at the location. If you bear in mind what was needed to do. Mm -hmm. Just adding to that, Frederick uh, Guna as well. I mean, we had those uh, portable conveyors. Uh, I say portable, yeah. but you know they're still pretty heavy. You know that you could actually bring into the plane, and uh, you know cargo could be placed, and it's like a conveyor belt. It just rolls it to the end of the aircraft, and obviously yeah, yeah. these conveyors are then taken out again. So. 
you know, for you saw it. In, you saw it in the video uh, when they were uh, yeah. rolling the, the the boxes with with this. Again, something I had not seen before COVID, honestly. So <laughs> interesting. Very interesting. Um, this is actually all the time that we have for questions today. So thanks so much again, Gunnar and Asok, for joining us today. Um, if you don't mind sticking around, uh, if there are any other questions by the audience, uh, we will very much appreciate you answering them. And with that, um, I would like to hand it over to my colleague, Harvey Williams, Senior Associate for Plug and Play Ventures, to welcome the startups. <laughs>